I'm David Oberhelman. I'm uh, the academic liaison for English, uh, foreign languages, theater, and music. But I also work a lot with the history department, uh, who is uh, co-sponsoring this series along with the OSU Library. And the Friends of Library uh, provided uh, the refreshments in the back of the room. Um, this is the first talk in the spring semester in the Great War uh, and its legacy, 1914 to 1918 series. We'll have two other talks uh, coming up in April. At the very end, uh, my colleague Barbara Miller and I, uh, who are the uh, co-directors of this series, will tell, give you a little uh, heads up, uh, a little preview of what's coming up in April. But today we're going to be uh, honored by uh, Dr. Joseph Burns, who will be talking about religion on the Western Front. This is part of a larger research project that he's been doing. Uh, Dr. Burns was uh, one of the authors showcased in our Celebrating Authors uh, program that we had uh, earlier this semester. And uh, in talking with him then, he said, well, my research interest is in France from about the French Revolution up to World War I. And so we're at the latter end of his area of uh, research interest right now. And he actually has a very uh, large project on religion in World War I that he's uh, working on. And this will be a little preview of that. Now, Dr. Uh, Burns is a professor emeritus of history and taught at OSU from 1976 until 2014. He's a specialist in European history, and his two most recent books are Catholic and French Forever, Religious and National Identity in Modern France, and Priests in the French Revolution, Saints and Renegades in a New Political Era. The chapter in Catholic and French Forever entitled The Limits of Reconciliation, Priests and Instituteurs in World War I on the Experiences of uh, Secular Teachers and Priests in the Trenches of World War I is one of the sources of his current work. And he is now planning a full-length book about preaching and various religious practices on the Western Front and on the home fronts in England, France, and Germany. So uh, thank you, Dr. Burns, and we will uh, have questions afterwards. Sir. Thank you. Well, I originally thought I entitled this God on the Western Front and thought that that might entail some subtleties that I wasn't ready to get into. So I fell back on a religion on the Western Front. But in, indeed, of course, we are talking about people's experience of God, experience of war, thoughts about God, uh, thoughts about war. They're uh, in the middle of the war, as a, a verse just brought out by a commentator and poet, a uh, writer, uh, writer of the time, uh, Sir John uh, C. Squire. And it was, God heard the embattled nations uh, sing and shout, Gosh, after England, and God save the king. God this, God that, God everything. Good God, said God. I got my work cut out. <laughs> and so uh, I, I can see that maybe God on the Western Front will eventually work. But uh, let's uh, do religion on the Western Front because we are talking about, well, uh, everything from barely expressed feelings through very formal, if you will, theological and Political writings. Now, I have a, a series of things that I do want to uh, get through. We are talking about varieties of soldiers and uh, church people. Those are official church connections. So, uh, think first of all, chaplains, but there are a certain number of uh, priests and pastors who were actually soldiers during the war and not have a choice. They were in the trenches, they had guns, and uh, they were uh, soldiers trying to find some kind of meaning, uh, some kind of goodness, and if you will, uh, a perception of God in all that was going on in this chaos. And so we're talking about uh, this combination of experience, experience of war, and experience of religion, and how uh, these experiences overlap in the, the lives 
how we have to do some select things or select groups and select uh, individuals. Uh, at the most formal, we are talking about church interpretations. Uh, that is to say, the interpretations of, uh, of bishops, leading uh, pastors, and I will be talking about rabbis also, because we talk in uh, Protestant Catholicism and Judaism uh, today, and what they try to do by way of finding meaning, goodness, and God. That is certainly different from what uh, your regular uh, foot soldier uh, is, is able to do. And yet we do need as many soldier testimonies uh, as, as we can get. And I will say we do have a lot so them now, they're just coming out. I, uh, some, some of the colleagues I was uh, to a uh, major bookstore in Paris in September and then a major bookstore in Berlin to see the shelves of books that uh, they're coming up. And they're not, they are studies, but certainly lots of testimonies. Uh, it's uh, an embarrassment of riches, and it sounds maybe too much because now it, it seems to me that anybody who discovers a nice letters that were had it comes from a, a great grandfather during the war is going to try and publish those. Now some are invaluable, but we have more picking and choosing to do, probably, uh, than we used to, uh, than we used to have. Uh, for today's presentation, I would like to work with some of the stories, the, if you will, that I have dealt with in the past, studied in the past, maybe even written up uh, in the past. And so it won't be uh, a smooth uh, Western city of introduction where you go across all the icons just to tell uh, a, a story that connects. Uh, I'll try to be coherent. Uh, I won't uh, be uh, working on, let's say, a, a balanced intro summary. Let's uh, see what we can do though. Uh, here I want to uh, uh, note two books, and I'm not going to be laying bibliography and I mean to jot down really on get these things to you later, but two representative books from this past year. Uh, the one that is most balanced and that I would not imitate that I would be inspired by as far as the division of the division of materials are concerned. I don't know if you can all read that in back. Uh, Xavier Boniface, it's not translated, but you can see, Histoire religieuse de la guerre, uh, entry of the churches into the war, and then he has God on the front, not God on the Western front, uh, not God on the Western uh, front, uh, religions on the home front. And of course, there we, we are paying attention to our bishops and pastors who write, uh, write a, a, any attempts to either uh, make sense for the folks at home in the churches or make sense for the chaplains and, in particular, say, the clergy soldiers out there uh, on the battlefield. There is then the heading. War of religion, religion of war, and that of course is an attempt to keep us show a nice balance there. Uh, I, I will have an observation about balance relative to the, the, the next book in a moment. Churches and the peace effort, uh, religious states in the overseas territories, and of course I'm not doing that, I'm going to the Western Front, I'm not even going to the Eastern and Southern Front, and to Southern. And so uh, the overseas territories has to do with the fighting in Africa and in, in, uh, across the Pacific Islands in, in particular. And uh, when uh, one of the England advances into the German territory, German in uh, East Africa, there are religious issues to be dealt with there. I uh, see too much material on that and I don't think I'll really try to process that uh, this time around. And did I skip the churches and the uh, uh, peace effort? 
He does center in on the effort, in particular, the few uh, leading uh, pastors in Germany and most of all um, Pope Benedict XVI, who was in a difficult position there between Austria, Austria is not on our Western front, Germany, but, uh, Austria and France, uh, because uh, both um, countries where the vast majority of the people are. Catholic, culturally Catholic, or uh, practicing Catholic, but especially Austria. Uh, in fact, by this time, because of all of the uh, government issues, the fighting, if you will, between secularists, or simplified secularists, and uh, conservative uh, religious believers. That is a story that I hate to be so glib about at this point. I've looked at it more carefully. I'm not going to give divisions of this uh, next book, and this is the book's the beginning to show what uh, it is done when it's all pulled together in an orderly fashion, because uh, I will, as I say, be giving a somewhat skewed view, even as I try to tell you what, where uh, these elements fit. Philip Jenkins, who is at Baylor and at Penn State, The Great and Holy War, How World War I Became a Religious Crusade. And he ventures very far. He starts uh, with yes, uh, the Western Front, and in fact, I'll momentarily get into a few miracles on the Western Front that he, he uh, looks at, but then he has to see to the, the extent to which, if you will, religious uh, loyalty, religious spirit, religious belief is used in order to make the political and military machines uh, function, the political and military uh, divisions of uh, society and of the war organization. I could uh, recommend that book as a way of getting started. In, in fact, that quote that I had from Sir John Squire is that book, I hadn't seen it before. God heard the embattled nations sing and shout. I better be brief about this because most of you know uh, how the world broke out and how things uh, finally came together. He, on the Western Front, uh, and we usually put all this day for that, but of course the assassination was on uh, June 28th, so we're not to the, uh, the outbreak of war. And of course was the assassination of the uh, Austrian Archduke in Sarajevo, and uh, there is the problem of the antagonism of Serbia to, uh, to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but also Russia, as put it over simply, uh, Serbia's uh, Slavic big brother and uh, protector. There's no photograph, of course, of the actual assassination. Gavrilo Princip, a Bosnian, uh, came uh, out of, not exactly out of nowhere. In fact, he was waiting on the corner fishing, thinking he missed his chance when the car came by due to an error on the part of the chauffeur, as you may know. Uh, so he shot and mortally wounded uh, the Austrian Archduke Ferdinand and his uh, wife. Here is an image that you may have seen before. In fact, I'm not totally satisfied with my own work on this. I've seen this as a photo of Gabriel Princip, the uh, assassin, who after, after the assassination, they tried to get a hold of him. But I believe it's one of his co-conspirators. So they, they, we'll, we'll check this. I've seen it in history books, though, as I'm using it here almost as if it's correct. But there's probably, uh, there's a good chance that that is not Princip, but there were several young men who were part of the conspiracy. Uh, Princip was the one who was able to bring off the actual assassination. Of course, carrying on then with, uh, in, in diplomacy, it looked as if things might not develop too badly. Here is the Austrian Foreign Minister, uh, Count Leopold von Berchtold. And Berchtold uh, then had to work with his government to decide what to do with Serbia. 
And as you know, they finally delivered an open navy uh, to Serbia. Uh, in the meantime, Germany is back and forth with, with the Kaiser, of course, as a dramatic figure. In the background, this is the Chancellor uh, uh, Theobald von Bettmann Holbeck. And uh, he uh, was very aware, of course, of getting into the into a major European conflict, but uh, the, the, the story of the German government, the Kaiser, uh, the Chancellor, and others, as they went back and forth as to just how much they wanted Austria to do or not do, or how much Austria could uh, depend upon them. That is a uh, somewhat subtle story to tell. Of course, then the other uh, is France that has, uh, is going to have problems with, uh, with Germany. And well, to put it the other way, as you know, uh, the German military were especially concerned about having Russia on one side and France on the other. Uh, here you see the visit of uh, President Pankow to the Russian Tsar. This is just, this is a. In, in July, in effect, with guarantees and with uh, good talking on both sides. Uh, as you know, then, it was really Russian mobilization that finally pushed things uh, over the edge. Uh, with uh, Russian mobilization, Germany had to mobilize and then uh, give another ultimatum to France, which uh, France could not accept. And uh, then the final entry uh, in, into the war, uh, the side of uh, Britain, uh, uh, France, on the other side of uh, Germany, uh, <laughs> Austria, Hungary, uh, the uh, Sir Edward Grey. The lights are going out all over Europe, and I don't think we'll see them moving again in our, in our time. And Gray, of course, dealing with uh, the issue of uh, German, the German menace of Belgium. And of course, we're spending time on Belgium in a moment. But uh, Gray was not totally clear, we say, some commentators say, with, uh, with the German, uh, the, uh, the German official he was uh, talking to, not perfectly clear that uh, Britain would would come in on the side of France, or would come in against Germany if Germany invaded Belgium. And of course, Germany did, and uh, we, it is on August 4th that Britain entered the war. See, war had been declared in Germany and Russia a day or two, uh, on the 1st, and then finally it's, we say August 4th for the beginning of the war. And this is where we are going to pay attention Great deal of attention to our Western Front. I hope you can get a general idea. We're talking about Germany, Belgium, and Northern France. And let's see, can I? Didn't see whether I had an arrow here. Yeah. Uh, the uh, here here is Paris. Can, I don't know if you can see the arrow moving at all, folks. Yeah. I guess if I move it, you can see it. And I want to pay attention then to this invasion across Belgium. You see, I uh, didn't want to have that uh, turn so much. Uh, the uh, f first and second German armies under von Kluck and von Bülow uh, going into Belgium, one, both hitting Liège, one going to the north of Liège and then uh, heading off afterwards on the northern uh, route and the other uh, on Birloff heading on the, uh, across the southern route. Uh, actually, I'm going to quickly get to, you, you see this uh, area here, here is Mons, still in Belgium, and uh, Le Cateau here, uh, with this computer, I'm, uh, you, know, you have these touch, touch uh, keyboards here, things move, I hope not to distract you too much jumping back and forth. In any case, uh, we have the German 
evasion across Belgium with the uh, famous set of German atrocities. And uh, that will bear some, uh, some description. I'll show another map that has been jumping in on us uh, uh, a bit. Uh, to, so you uh, can see where the Western Front finally ended. It, the, uh, the Germans got this far, and we not only have to talk about Mont saint le Cateau, but get down to the Marne here, and then uh, not making it really being turned back at the Marne, then the uh, German army went back to the N, A-I-S-N-E, the N uh, river. And thereafter, uh, uh, German and uh, French-British forces tried to uh, out outrun one another uh, going north, uh, and do end runs around one another. So, uh, you know many of you uh, that. And here is the broad picture. Uh, you can see that we're talking about, let's go uh, to northern France. That is the Western Front. And of course, that's from Germany's point of view. When we say uh, the Western Front, we are talking about what was west for the Germans. And the Eastern Front is what was east for the Germans. There is then the Eastern Front, which we uh, don't deal with today, and two Southern Fronts. The one coming down to the Balkans, because uh, Austria-Hungary invaded Serbia, and then the one in North Italy, as Austria-Hungary, sometimes with German help, tried to move into Italy. Italy, as you know, was originally part of the three-member team with uh, Britain and France. Uh, no, no, excuse me, was part of the three-part uh, 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 team, a member of, uh, with uh, Germany, Austria, Hungary, but did not go into the war at the beginning and eventually ended in with, uh, on the side of uh, Ger France and England. And uh, it was then Turkey that uh, joined the Central Powers. Well, I want to begin to talk about my soldiers. And some of my miracles here, uh, too. I have, uh, the, the, you see, we're dealing with experiences and interpretations. And this is then Western Front. You see where we are in northern France after the move to Belgium. Uh, the testimonies from members of the army, regular army, and we have uh, a good collection of diaries, and as I was saying earlier, more, more family correspondence, which can be very helpful. It will be very helpful, but indeed uh, will require a lot of sorting out if uh, those of us who are trying for articles or books on these uh, things. I know I'm getting But for those who are trying for balanced explanations, there's a great deal of sorting out to do. Now, I want to make a few remarks about this religion of the inarticulate. It is a phrase used by a British soldier who had been an African seminarian, and ended up writing a certain number of tracts as a soldier. And uh, he, Donald Hankey was his name. Uh, his, uh, his collection of his writings in uh, the uh, Journal of a uh, Student. And he said, he was a student, but he was a seminary and almost an English priest. And uh, his uh, remarks on the religion of the United I think we need to know from the beginning. If we're talking about the average soldier, no more than the average person, well, maybe we, maybe we should be careful in the Bible, but, but I'll say, I don't think the Bible, but I was in Latin or at all, but you're probably the average person in Chicago. Uh, how much is the average person in Chicago going to do today? How do you know you're going to be talking about religion? So uh, the, uh, the soldiers, too, or the danger, you figure they think a bit more about the other person. Some did. Donald Hankey uh, then wrote about, uh, if you will, the average soldier, and apart from those who are just totally wrapped up in fear of women, we had all these good, uh, these good soldiers, and uh, they were basically unselfish, terrible, they admired, uh, they admired others, 
who were somewhat accomplished. He said, when uh, I didn't hear conversations about religion, however, and again, Hank was very self-conscious of the religion. had been an Anglican seminar and done missionary work and decided to do ordination, not to get ordained. But uh, for him, the problem was not appreciating the religion of those who can't articulate it, who can't describe it, who don't, are not able to say specific things about their religion, uh, their religious thoughts, their thoughts on God, their thoughts on uh, virtue. And uh, he, let me read uh, a few lines here that these people still have basic goodness. He very much appreciates it. He says, the chaplains, as a rule, failed to realize this. They saw the inarticulateness and assumed a lack of any religion. They remonstrated uh, with their hearers for not saying their prayers and not coming to communion and not being afraid to die without making their peace with God. They did not grasp that the men really had deep-seated beliefs in goodness, and that the only reason why they did not pray in good communion is that they never connected the goodness in which they believed with the God in whom the chaplains said they ought to believe. If they had connected Christianity with, and he had already given these as some of the virtues, if they had connected Christianity and this, uh, with unselfishness and the rest, they would have been prepared to look at Christ as their master and as their savior. Of course, he's speaking that as a as a And uh, then using a you know, biblical and theological terminology that that's the uh, understanding. He ends up saying that if chaplains and others could appreciate the goodness of these people, if they did, they would perhaps find a stronger face than their own. It is certainly arguable that we educated Christians are in our all way almost as inarticulate as the uneducated whom we always want to instruct. And more or less, if for any of us, how can we talk about our most symptoms? And how can we talk about our most profound beliefs? So how would you expect too much to be said? So I, that's a rather long uh, set of ideas there, but all relative to these tiny books, uh, these collections now, correspondence, diaries. And I, I didn't know one presently, but I went across the whole series of selections from diaries. And uh, there, to see if I could find something about religion on the Western Front. And there was very, very little that you could call explicitly religious. Uh, they just didn't talk about it. Now, uh, quickly down the, the rest. <laughs> the uh, screen here. Uh, the, the, the generals, often, so many of them have to be war, wrote, or for the purpose of apology, and how they lost the life of so many hundreds of thousands of guys. Uh, the generals uh, did write about religion or communicated about religion, not only in these uh, apologies at, at, at after the war at the end, but uh, sometimes too in their in their regular writing. Uh, we can note, uh, a, in particular, perhaps uh, the British general General Haig, the very very committed Presbyterian, very fond of Anglicanism, and very fond of these uh, horrible advances of lost hundreds of thousands of guys. Uh, and uh, then uh, Marshall or General Fush, uh, who was the general at the beginning of it, you know, ended up being in charge of all of the forces to this, the Americans uh, somewhat uh, allied, but not under uh, Fush in the, almost under Fush. There is a technicality there, they're different from the uh, British Push, very religious, pray a lot. He had a brother who was a Jesuit priest, and uh, this was uh, no nonsense about uh, his expression of 
a religion. And uh, so uh, we, can, we can look across the, the various uh, generals and a few officers, higher officers who did talk about religion in the course of the war or after the war, saying what it meant to them uh, uh, during the war. <clears throat> I have to be careful, uh, as you know, the last study was of uh, one particular group of uh, Republican clergy, and they used to be French that was a very smart huh? uh, revolutionary clergy uh, during the revolutionary decade in particular in France and maybe not 1799. But uh, the, the, the clergy and all kinds of especially the French priests out there, naturally that's what they're talking about, that's what they're thinking about. They've come out of the seminary, they've come from churches, and I have never been able to confirm the exact number, but there are about uh, uh, 12,000 French priests who were in the trenches of nuns. Or, let's say, they weren't chaplains. I better be careful. They weren't chaplains. A certain number were able to wrangle because they did not want to be fighting their with KNS and rifles. They were able to wrangled the medical service. Uh, but a, any number of those I men did write, write letters and we have collections coming out uh, weekly uh, there too. A friend and colleague of mine at uh, Death University of Lyon has just published beautiful, right out a wonderful book of uh, letters from the diocese that he works in uh, Moulin, that's in the center of uh, France's Bourbonnais. And so he had uh, he had worked out his kind of huge collection of letters that were sent back to one of the spiritual directors in the uh, seminary uh, in, uh, in the Allier. Uh, very briefly, see what were we uh, uh, looking at other than these testimonies? Of course, that we tried to put together into some kind of a, a unit, a unity, uh, relative to uh, Catholic soldiers. We uh, tend to know, because the chaplains or the priest buddies uh, tend to know uh, how, uh, how they go to church services. And so I say, you Christ mass. In other words, attendance in Mass, other sacraments, especially in particular, it's like an independence confession, confessing your sins before you go to the And it's uh, again, very a powerful element of the Catholic system, Catholic worship uh, system, and a variety of other devotions. Uh, for uh, Protestants, and here I do mean in particular, okay, the other side, the German Protestants. Uh, because uh, the Anglicans are divided up, uh, this is simplistic between high church and low church. If they're Anglo or Anglo Catholic, you will see more of the, the Catholic side of things. And if they're uh, middle uh, or evangelical Anglican, then the Protestant heading uh, uh, works. Hymns, of course, uh, uh, hymns, uh, indeed, if you know. Tradition of hymns that even if you are no longer religious, you can still remember or recognize some of those hymns because of parents and grandparents and earlier uh, religious experiences. In fact, I think them writing relative to the English uh, soldiers, where they would take a hymn for second and words to it. Now, of course, that is not exactly a religious experience that they're doing, but uh, you would take a, a great hymn to it and then make up some kind of a wise guy verse about your commanding walks, or about the, uh, about the enemy, or about what you're going to do. And the, the writer that I uh, got this from said, no, you know, that's not nothing. We should say that they know their hymns. And however, uh, they, they worked with them. Pocket Bibles, uh, uh, of course, and prayer books. And I'll, I'll want to do more on that, the, the range of the distribution of pocket Bibles. 
I think much more of that in America enters the war uh, after April 1917. So for those of us who are used to people still hanging on pocket Bibles, <laughs> Another, but you know, it's it's a form of apostle, but it's a form of communication. So Americans may be more with uh, pocket Bibles and then prayer books. The rabbis, at Jewish Sabbath and feast uh, festivals, the rabbis, uh, of course, make for a very interesting study. They mainly challenge them, not so many uh, rabbis as as soldiers either. Because there is a substantial population, uh, well, a little population, I'm sorry, but a substantial population, substantial in England and in Germany and in France. And these guys are going to have to fight them. Of course, the French had to fight one another, too. The Catholic French had to uh, fight one another. And we'll get to some of their remarks. Now, uh, to get us through through Belgium and uh, northern France, and uh, then maybe we'll uh, work, uh, not so chronologically, on uh, forms of uh, testimony. As they sample dramas at the beginning, the drama of the German army going across Belgium with resistance from the Belgian army. And from Belgian civilians, and therein lies the problem distinguishing between civilians and members of the military guard, and members of the official army. Uh, the, the, the German soldiers never, never, I shouldn't say never, I've read a number of testimonies. German soldiers, and now we're the ordinary soldiers, but fairly. Writing about going across uh, some of the Belgian villages, of course, up to the siege uh, at Liège and beyond, saying how they were being fired on. They tried to go to, to, the, to the folks there, but they would be fired upon, and then they would describe how they themselves shot back. And yes, they, you know, they did get some women and children in that, but I did see. Any remorse? Sometimes a little bit of uh, sadness. And uh, so I have chronicles of the German invasion of Belgium. I'm giving you one collection of uh, diaries in particular. There is a, an archive of these diaries, and they're just published uh, in, in German. Uh, Uh, 
their, uh, so there we're not talking about explicit uh, religion too much, other than every now and then something like a thank God or a reference to a service and no particular description to know what is going on there. Now, uh, two uh, wonderful sets of stories, and I've got some images for you. Yeah, I better not bounce back to the map, but uh, remember, just before you get over the Belgian border, into France's Mons, M-O-S. And that is where the German army, that's on the book, was very successful. And uh, the, the British army, by that time, had made it over under Bowen's eye, and the teaching was under there, that said, yes, the British general's name was Sir John French. So the, uh, the, the general French was the British. And then it was a uh, general Lambertac, who was the French. Sixth Army, the von Fuchs Army pushed them back. Lanzac, uh, much to the French Supreme Commander Jacques uh, Chagrin, Lanzac uh, pulled back. And then that uh, advanced British force. Uh, the story was that they were terribly outnumbered and that there was a miracle at Mons because. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll make a move here. I have to come back on the mound. Uh, so just remember what we have on the uh, mound. At most, presumably, there were angels. A certain British soldier thought that there were angels who stopped the Germans. And in fact, uh, it looked as if maybe not the angels, but some of the Germans then were, were shot down. But presumably, there was an overwhelmingly superior German force. And that uh, was considered to be something of a victory because uh, then uh, the uh, German army uh, uh, pulled back, not completely, it wasn't completely French uh, were uh, pulled back to, and we have then Le Cateau, which is uh, then over on the uh, French side. So here are some images uh, that were, of course, later gone up. There are the angels stopping the Germans. So the angels of Mons. And the CDs were, they got a little uh, uh, round of little stories, generally after most, and they were grown up a year or two or three after that, especially in England. But the uh, miracle of most, well, it could have been named some saw sort of angel, some saw sort of St. George, uh, and some saw sort of heavenly warriors that they were the old British archers from the Battle of Argentina. <laughs> earlier era. Of course, uh, here the Arancourt uh, British warriors were also helping French, and also Lanzac could get back, which they weren't doing uh, first time around. I mean, a little bit of a wise time, of course, ultimately, uh, these, these stories, of course, are just stories, but they do represent a certain amount of um, religious, religious thought. They might not have made it, but God was helping us. And of course, that creation. So, uh, George Stock, England, uh, God said the king. Uh, so God helping all of these, uh, all of these people. So th there are the angels. I think I have another uh, image. There are the heavenly warriors. Uh, it, it, again, it's hard to know whether those are angels or the Arhan Kula warriors. I don't have anything for St. George. But in any case, in the course of three days, the British were able to hold off the Germans and get out of there. Otherwise, the British Expeditionary Force, the base of the British Army, would have been, uh, would have been done. So there's that. And then, of course, as the uh, German forces, uh, Kluck and von Bülow, uh, came, came in, headed towards Paris, close to Paris, and then they uh, had to make a turn. And at that point, a combination of Joffre's ingenuity and help uh, from the British, many of you know the story, the, uh, there was a gap between the uh, two uh, German armies, the British went in there, and then uh, the French were able to uh, put up a wonderful defense uh, a little farther on down the Marne uh, River, and then of course goes out in Paris and went into the Senate, a little more north-south. And what I have here, and say, what is this? I actually, it only came from a few years later. I was looking for this thing for years. It's called the Missile of the Miracle of the Mark. So I put up the 
sells you out into the mound, the prayer book, which has all kinds of images in it of uh, the, uh, the French the French victory. And I'll, I, I don't, I'll have to describe them, but at least we have the symbol of uh, these uh, ideas here. Uh, that's a, so I have a mint copy, so clearly uh, we can't say that this had broad distribution and had uh, a, enormous influence. There's this uh, wonderful uh, initialed mint copy, uh, leather, wonderful leather and gold binding. And uh, the, can you maybe you barely see it? The first page, of course, is Christ's crucifixion, but there are French soldiers at the base of the, uh, of the cross. You might be able to see a little red, of course, they had the red uh, uh, pants. Uh, and so, uh, clearly you came in and, no, that was a bad idea. Uh, the, uh, uh, so that is one of the color plates in my Missile of the Miracle of the Marne. Uh, the first page, and this is St. Uh, Genevieve, patron, well, patron of Paris and St. Paris is the work of the Huns. <laughs> And of course, now saving Paris uh, from the from the Germans. I should have brought this, uh, but I was afraid to to do it. I, I, I do so that you could examine it at some point. Uh, another color plate. There is uh, actually an image of uh, Christ in the boat coming to see. comes to see. There's that, but underneath there are columns of French soldiers uh, marching along uh, on the uh, on the Champs Elysees, and so that's a little farther on in in the missile. And then these black uh, these gray engravings go across uh, the top of a great number of pages. And there's a series of engravings that then repeat. Repeat as you go across this book, which of course is a collection of prayers, both uh, sacramental as for the Mass, this one, and, uh, and other prayers. And again, I'm afraid it'll just be token, token gesturism here. So the scene uh, uh, on the left is mobilization, uh, and uh, on the right there is the first encounter. There's some soldiers already. Uh, wounded, lying down. Well, they're they're on the ground, and this uh, you see how it's page after page here. I have uh, more. This is a special prayer service. The uh, Battle of the Marne was made around uh, let's say fifth through the eighth or ninth of September. So here is on the fourth a special prayer service on the left. It's even more difficult to see, I'm afraid, so I also apologize and just get it uh, quickly through this mobilization. And then the first encounter, there is sort of a battle scene on the right there. As usual, I can, I can see it on my computer, but it doesn't come up uh, as well. Uh, no, excuse me, that is, uh, that is further church services on. You have a crowd on the outside of a church. On the left is not by Paris itself, but it is north, well north of the Marne, quite a bit north of the Marne, the Cathedral of Rennes, Reims. Uh, Rennes, of course, was animated by the uh, Germans. And now, see, this is 1916. They really got this stuff together. So it's just quick commemoration of the miracle of the Marne. But there is that. And then there is. Uh, the the uh, actual well, attempt to do an image of the battle on the on the right you see varieties of smoke going up in, in the uh, in back there uh, excuse me I, I went backwards I want to do the Marne and then there is the two more images there the uh, a, a church service in a in a trench uh, that would be on the on the left and uh, on the right uh, burials. Now those uh, mainly went across uh, the Missile of America of the Mine, and uh, the the preface. For that miracle, um, there was a, 
whistle. Who do you think None of the most type nonsense. It was a genius figure, and of course, then there was the broader theology of how they were to write. The, 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 the God was helping us here, and of course, he helped us through regular military needs. We just were good. Okay. And so, uh, that is uh, two, two approaches where we have as it were, apparitions and miracles uh, come up in quite different ways. Uh, some of them just hitting, hitting around his later stories, and some of them not. Now, I, I want to look at a few things here, so that we have um, time for this. Yes. Uh, the way uh, the attrition, and this is a bit behind the scenes, of course, so it's, it's in home front, uh, you know, varieties of writings, uh, or, or actually a certain amount of this was in sermons that were later, later published, where I have Germany and Britain, official churches, and I mean Protestant or Anglican and Protestant. I don't know if I'll get to my Catholic uh, Germans and Catholic French uh, theologians having at it back and, uh, and forth. So I have uh, the sins of Germany according to Britain. You see that uh, it's, their, it's their overweening ambition that is the problem. And uh, the most militant, I'll come right down to uh, Arthur Winnington Ingram, the Bishop of London, who, more than the Archbishop of Canterbury, Randall Wilson, uh, Winnington Ingram was a real nationalist here. Do you realize, all of you, what a home for freedom this England has been for centuries? And not only is Great Britain the home of freedom, but she is the mother of freedom throughout the world. We have grown free nations. There is no other country like this. We seem to have a knack, a genius, for creating free nations who love their mother. I have lived over a year and a half in Germany, and I know what I'm talking about. And, of course, he was promoting and the absolute right of the British, uh, British cause, and how, uh, in fact, it was their duty to, uh, in effect, end civilization against, uh, against the Germans. Uh, other, uh, other writers, and I should have another book up here, but I thought there would be one too many. There is a, a wonderful collection of these and other sermons. I'll leave them in from some other stories. Uh, sermons, though, which which contain these issues and themes. So uh, the, the notion that uh, Germany is immoral, since the Germany, according to Britain, Bismarckism, Kaiserism, uh, so uh, militarism, pressure, these are all ways of dealing with militarism, uh, rampant militarism, uh, militarism is the source of the culture. And so uh, the, the, the notion of an emperor, the notion of a, a state that has a token, token legislature, or a legislature that is, that is still so hierarchical that it, 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 it's hard to qualify it as uh, democratic. Prussianism and Bernhardism, some of you may have come across the, uh, the, the, the German quite a bit of attention uh, for all of that. And we still use it, it's still anthologized, so uh, some of our 20th century history anthologies have von Bernhardt uh, in that. Uh, the, well, that was am amorality and then uh, militarism. I won't try now to uh, distinguish between the two here, but you'll note that uh, the, the, the great movement for uh, the liberal interpretation of the 
the sum of these almost secularized interpretations of the Bible. Uh, the Hayes uh, source in Germany beginning with Schleiermacher uh, in the 1830s and uh, then coming forward across the, uh, the century. <clears throat> German theological and biblical liberalism. And here the uh, British are uh, criticizing that. I have some images here. There is uh, the, the King's chaplain, William Sunday, who wrote to see the meaning of the war for Germany and Great Britain. It's a modern edition of that. Have an image here of good old uh, Bishop Whittington Ingram with uh, the great uh, uh, British Admiral John Jellicoe. And there is Whittington Ingram walking along with John Jellicoe. Easier to see than my Missile of the Marne uh, images. And uh, now then, uh, the, the defects uh, in, in German uh, Christianity, this is continuing, I see from the Protestant, Protestant Anglican side, I want to get to, from uh, this to what uh, the, the Germans had to say about the British, and then we can probably open things up for, for questions. I have a number of other things that I could look at with you, but I, I, I don't want to to jump around today. Well, we'll see what uh, we can get through here. Uh, the defects in uh, German Christianity, uh, there was an attempt to say, well, Luther is the problem, but just Luther as he got older. So here is a, you might say, a Protestant non-German attempt to uh, uh, appreciate the young Martin Luther before he got so irritable and anti-Semitic, uh, the variety of other things that uh, one could say about uh, uh, Martin Luther. Uh, and this is still uh, British uh, writing, criticism. And there, uh, is, you see, now, Unholy Trinity, Ben Hardy is back. Uh, uh, Trajka is uh, a, a German historian who uh, promoted Advanced form of nationalism, uh, shall we say, <laughs> to uh, later 1800s, and had a lot of influence. Of course, here they're carrying on. Somehow, those poor German soldiers out there on the front were reading on Tragic, which is not uh, true as you can imagine. And, and then Nietzsche, uh, the, of course, the, both the uh, Protestants. Ways. So those, and then a great quote, let's see if I can find it here. Yes, uh, it is from the German poet of the earlier part of the 19th century, actually, Heinrich Heine. And here are his words about what happens when the Germans go militaristic. <laughs> I remember first hearing these words when I was uh, young. It was a documentary on Hitler. Oh, but <clears throat> here they were using Heine, uh, Heine, Heine uh, in World War I. <clears throat> and here he uh, wrote, And uh, when once that restraining talisman of the cross is broken, then the old combatants will rage with the fury celebrated by the Norse poets. Then the old stone gods will rise from unremembered ruin and rub the dust of a thousand years from their eyes. And Thor will leap to life at last and bring down the gigantic hammer on the Gothic cathedral. And so, of course, that worked wonderfully well. Uh, uh, wonderfully well for uh, all of this. And then you see on the screen, in any case, other criticisms, especially this one by the wonderful uh, uh, British priest pastor, uh, Jeffrey Sturt Kennedy, uh, who said, uh, in effect, uh, they're, they're promoting 
the most uh, violent form of survival of the fittest, uh, Huxley's interpretation of Darwin. And uh, that is uh, the, the, the so social Darwinism, in effect. Germany is saying the strongest, uh, uh, the strongest are the best and deserve uh, deserve to uh, to win their and in some of the uh, usual criticisms images there's Heinrich Heine we don't need to see him now uh, it, the chaplain uh, stuttered Kennedy who along with Hanke had a great appreciation of if you will the common soldier I'll only do a few of these and then we'll end I think two minutes. This is virtually uh, an hour now. Uh, the, the, an idea of the sins of Britain according to Germany. British, uh, British sins according to German preachers. Uh, these are in the churches and of course getting back to the front line. Uh, I have a few theologians names or pastors. They're both pastors and theologians. Lutheran in the main. Uh, but I, I, I can't make anything of them here. I just did it so there'd be, uh, well, some concrete qualities to all of this. Uh, Sins of Britain, according to the uh, Germans, betrayal of kinship. Of course, the, uh, the Kaisers up there also, the British are our cousins. And uh, later on, of So betrayal of kinship with Germany, why are they doing that? Let's see, yeah, we'll get down to these uh, features, uh, other features in a moment. <clears throat> Again, imperialism and uh, the, uh, say, but German, the Germans had Luther on this side who went against Roman imperialism. So here is the other side, the other way of looking at uh, Luther, not just a child of Luther, but maybe a quasi-Catholic uh, acceptability quotient. But uh, uh, that, and a uh, major theologian, Saber, for self-dignity, Germany, the very inferiority complex, the Kaiser had an inferiority complex, as you know, his grandmother was Queen Victoria, and so very big uh, presence. And then the accusation uh, of uh, the hypocrisy of Britain about little Belgium. And elsewhere they had to say, France is not like Belgium. Might have had a point uh, there uh, for all of that. But little Belgium, they're kind of worried about. Uh, but actually, at this point, there is some, some of you know the story of King Leopold and Belgium King. Horrors of the Congo ended up in Congo under uh, his rule. Well, I'm paying some attention to that. And uh, again, here's, here's Anglican, so quasi Protestant, if not Protestant England. And look at their alliances with uh, Orthodox Russia. I guess I'm almost, almost done here, and I think my luck is starting to run out on this, uh, this item here. Uh, and, uh, and the Catholics, uh, too, of course, quasi-Catholic France uh, is uh, a, a problem. And they, uh, I don't have it on the screen here, but the Germans did have a problem in there saying, no, we've got these alliances with Catholics. So I washed it off right behind them. So they had uh, to do a little fancy footwork to get around the fact that the uh, Prince of Valera was Catholic. Uh, Austria uh, in all of that. And uh, uh, they did know in Serbia, Serbia, who uh, assassinated the king and queen, but there was a Serb assassination led by the same guy who actually supported the 
their attention and things are going to be And so uh, Britain is in effect betraying, uh, betraying Germany with its alliance with Islam and, uh, and Africans. And uh, these things, I, I don't know, I've seen them more at stereotypes uh, of Germany uh, earlier on. Say, obviously, any is a German success. In so Germany, there, there was in part certain leading Germans uh, in government and it's talk about my uh, culture uh, and this of uh, England, but Germany had done so well as you know uh, economically. Uh, and industry, a huge build up of industry, really the second industrial revolution in Germany's. Uh, and so and Britain is envy of German success, given that we're now the cousins who are that. And uh, they then refer to this is a stereotype in Germany of uh, the penny pinching shopkeeper's mentality of the British. Well, I don't think I'd best try to get on uh, beyond that. I can't uh, do my Catholic, uh, French Catholic, uh, uh, German, in effect, South German carrying on relative uh, to, to one another. There's some images there, and I won't try to do these uh, uh, German responses. Actually, for the remarks from the uh, British side, we uh, have the remarks from the German side, back and forth, quite a, quite a detailed set of things going there relative uh, to their understanding of the enemy and how uh, things, uh, things uh, should, be, should be much better. So uh, we have behind the lines, we have on the lines, behind the lines, and of course, and there's testimony that I can just give you a few slides. Uh, in a second. Uh, there is a full hour of this. Uh, 